Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary, and others are interviewed by those who listen to Divine Truth teachings. Jesus is interviewed by Justin Creek on the topic of parenting and children. The interview was held on the 15th of April, 2013, in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 1, Part 2. Question seven. How can a child learn to have a relationship or connection with God when their parents are blocked to God? And how can we best assist our children from this place? Well, it's a very good question. The answer is they can't. <laughs> if a parent is blocked towards God, the child will find it very, very difficult to develop a relationship with God until such a time, uh, except under one or two circumstances. So let's, uh, let's assume for a moment that the parent is blocked to God. So yep. the parent does not have a relationship with God and also has some feelings about God that they don't want a relationship with God. And the child comes into the parent's world. Mm -hmm. right? Now, as long as that parent is not imposing its emotional condition upon the child and not forcing the child through some emotional method of coming to the same conclusions as the parent, yep. then the child will be relatively free to start engaging a relationship with God on its own right. Does that make sense? Yep. But if yep. the parent in any way imposes emotionally on the child or in any way imposes its belief systems on the child, it will severely restrict the child from developing a relationship with God and therefore probably in the end result in the child not having a relationship with God. So it just really depends not upon the injury mm. being released from the parent so much as the injury of imposing the parent's will upon the child being released from the parent. Yeah. When the parent imposes its own will and emotions upon the child through its, act, through its activities and through its actions and through its feelings, then the child will probably conform to the parent's belief system. Now, if the parent is braver than that and also more humble than that and recognises that it has belief systems that may be not out of harmony with love, and refuses to impose those belief systems upon the child, then the child has a much greater capacity to develop a relationship with God even if the parent does not have one. However, what we notice in society generally is if the parent does not have a relationship with the child, it often has very strong emotional reasons for not having such relationship. And of course it then attempts to impose those same emotional reasons and belief systems upon the child. And that is not giving the child the freedom to make its own choice on the matter, but rather already the child has an emotional feeling inside of the child that if it has a relationship with God, it will incur the displeasure or yeah. disapproval of its parent. And that's not allowing the child to be free to develop its own relationship yeah. with God if it's so desired. It's very hard for a parent with emotional injuries with God to allow a child to not to, to develop a relationship with God without having some emotional injuries with God. Yeah. Mm. And this is yeah. why it is imperative that parents address their emotional injuries with God, whatever they are, and their desire to rebel against God, whatever their reasons are. It's imperative that the parents yeah. address these particular issues. Yeah. And this is something that we must understand as parents. We might believe that we are capable of dealing with something with equality and dealing with something with no um, projection of control and dealing with something with a complete openness while we maintain a certain perspective that is actually physically impossible. Yep. Inside of ourselves, it's physically impossible to not have some kind of effect on our child based on what we believed. Yep. And so this is very important that our, we must understand as parents that our belief systems and our emotions are very important. We must understand that if we do not desire to bring them into harmony with absolute truth, there will be a negative effect on our child and it is unavoidable. And we've got to see this relationship that if we choose to, to, to stay in our current condition where we're out of harmony with love and out of harmony with truth and out of harmony with humility, if we choose that condition actively or we refuse to develop from that condition, we are automatically harming our child whether we believe we are or not. 
And so it's very important as a parent that we yeah. understand that underlying principle. Yeah. Yeah. It is unavoidable. We cannot hope to make our child believe things or, or feel things or even allow our child to believe or feel things that we ourselves are not allowing within ourselves. Yeah. It's, a, it's an unavoidable process. We will impose upon this child who's developing our rules, not God's. We yeah. will impose upon the child who's developing our truth, not God's. We'll impose upon the child developing our version of love and not God's. And it's imperative that we give that up. And if we're truly humble as a parent, we would desire to give that up, even if it's not for our own sake, at least for the sake of the child. Yeah. 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 So it's pretty... Would it be fair to say that it's... Parenting, if I can use that word, is pretty simple. Yep. If you want to do it... God's way. God's way. Yeah. Parenting is very simple when you want to do it God's way. It also is very enjoyable when you do it God's way because you, you, you don't break any laws and as, as a result, all of the subsequent results of parenting are all happy. Then none of them are sad, right? Parenting as the way people do it on earth at the moment is very painful. Very painful process for the majority of parents. Very painful process for the majority of children as well because we've chosen to do it out of harmony with God's way and as a result of that, there's lots of pain and suffering that gets created. And, and we need to understand that every time we choose to do it our way rather than God's way, we are going to create pain and suffering if our way isn't in harmony with love. Yep. And a lot of times we believe it's in harmony with love. We, we think it's in harmony with love, but it's completely demonstrable that it's out of harmony with love. And, and we, we often are in the state as parents where we lack humility and as a result of that, we have painful consequences in our life, in our relationship with our children, and yep. our children have painful consequences, often that they deal with for the rest of their life on earth as a result of our actions as parents. So you can see, like, my, my, my feelings are, if you're choosing to be a parent, become a very humble person, completely open to all the truths of the universe, whether you personally believe them or not. <laughs> Um, you, you're going to need to take these actions, otherwise you're going to create pain and suffering in your own life and in the lives of your own children. Yep. Yep. And then their subsequent children. And of the course track. their subsequent children, if they make the same choice, you know, to, to yep. walk away from God's principles and laws and, and in particular walk away from the principles of love, then their children are going to have the same damage and their children will have the same damage and so forth and so forth. And this is how you get the sins of the parents perpetrated against the child and then the next generation and the next generation after that. And this is what I meant in the Bible when, when I said that the sins of the parents get given to the child for generation after generation after generation. Yep. And it's a sad consequence of parents that lack humility. Yep. Um, because if we, if we had a humility, we would never choose to do that. So would it be fair to say as a parent, you know, let's say you, you deal with your own injuries around uh, a topic or, yep. a, or a certain situation yep. and that you then understand what God's view is. Yes. And so you then, you're then doing it lovingly to your children. Not only is it a, it's not an intellectual thought though, because once you've released the error inside of your soul and it's no longer existing, the way the soul operates is that you now can absorb God's truth about that error into your soul and now your soul automatically does exactly the thing in harmony yep. with love. And since it's automatic, the child feels it in that moment. In that moment, it's like as soon as you make a change, the child instantly yep. changes. Yep. Yep. And we need to understand it's not this intellectual thing, but a complete soul-based thing. Yep. So is it at that point that the, like the multi-generational injury stops? Exactly. If it was an injury that my parents passed down to me, and I've now released this particular injury emotionally, and my soul's now absorbed a new truth from God as a result of my desire for it to do that. From that moment on, my all subsequent generations of children that, that might come from me are all free of that injury. Yeah. That's the gift you give to every other generation that follows after you. If you hold on to the injury or create even more injuries then the penalty, you can see, is that every subsequent mm -hmm. generation also will probably contain the same injury until somebody of your children, one brave individual of your children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren, oh, yep. decides to stop that cycle 
through dealing with that particular injury and releasing it from themselves. Yep. That's the gift, one of the other gifts we give to our children. Every emotional injury that we're humble to and release is another emotional injury they do not have to bear yeah. yep. for their life or that they don't have to choose themselves at some point in their future to release. And so it's very, very important that we go through that process ourselves. If we're, if we're true, sincere, unhypocritical parents, we will willingly engage that process. If we're hypocritical, we won't willingly engage it. We'll, we'll want the child to correct themselves, but we won't want to correct ourselves. Yep. Yeah. So let's say as a parent, I'm creating an injury, automatic injury within yep. my child. I'd say, for example, that <coughs> And it might be something you're even unconscious about. Yep. yep, and that perpetuates through generation say. So do yep. I then have a law of um, conversation to deal with for the multi-generational? Of course. Yep. Of course, because, because any injury that's in yourself, and this is a part of the consequences of the law, any injury that's in yourself that is perpetrated, um, and by the way, it's the same consequence as if you had no children. Sorry, can you explain that? Yeah, see, so, so you were thinking that what I was saying was that if you had a child and you had a certain injury, right, that the consequence on your soul would be worse than if you didn't have the child and retain the injury. Right? And I'm saying to you, mm. no, that's not how God's laws work. The fact that you are retaining the injury and are resistant to the injury has its own consequence. And part of the consequence is if you had have had children you would have passed this injury down to them. And that consequence is attributed to you even though you've had no children. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you can't make a choice to say, I'm not going to have a child and therefore be in a better soul condition. Your soul oh, okay. condition right. okay. will be determined right. by the feeling that's in you. It won't yep. be determined by the fact you had children while the feeling was in you. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Your soul condition is determined by its condition right now, whether you have children or not. Yep. And But... Part of the determination of the consequence is if you had have had children, you would have passed this down to them and your unwillingness to be humble is a part of the consequence of dealing with a particular yeah. injury. Do you understand yeah. what I'm saying there? Yeah, that's See, pretty... God's laws are so fine, my friend. They are like, <laughs> they're like every little tiny nut and bolt is yeah. accounted for. <laughs> yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. And you can't bit... avoid the consequences of a law just by not having child, children, Yeah. right? The reality is the consequences of the law are imposed upon you. And one of the consequences of breaking every law is that if you had have had children, you would have passed this injury down to them and you would have willingly done so. Right? Yeah. And there is a consequence to that outcome, even though you haven't had the children yet. Yeah. Yeah. OK. That... Yeah. OK. So, so there's no excuse for not dealing with an injury. You can't say to yourself, yeah. oh, I'm not going to have a child and therefore not have to deal with this injury. You can't say that because the reality is the consequences are already imposed upon your soul yep. with the choice you made. Yep. And it didn't matter whether you had children or not. It's the same consequence that's placed upon your soul. And the consequence is that if you would have had children, you would have passed it down, and that's an unloving action. Yep. You would have chosen to take that unloving action, so that consequence is already imposed upon your soul whether you had the child or not. Yeah. <laughs> So hypotheticals don't exist. Hypotheticals don't exist. <laughs> and, and the reality is that everything that God uh, actually, all of God's laws uh, have all the consequences involved in, the, in, the, uh, pen, in, the, in regards to the negative consequences of breaking them, have them all opposed upon the soul, whether we were going to have children or not. But one of the consequences is you have the ability to have children and so therefore would have passed this down and that consequence is yeah. attributed to your soul. The, it's a demonstration of the lack of love that's in us if we're willing to pass down a multi-generational injury to our future generations. Yep. And that is a condition of our soul that does need to be corrected. In other words, we need to get to the point where we see that it's not loving to hold on to an emotional injury just from the perspective of the potential of us having a child and passing that emotional injury to them. We need to yeah. see that that would be an unloving choice to hold on to the to, injury. Yeah. So, so instead of saying, oh, I'm not going to have a child because I've got all these injuries, hoping that that will somehow mitigate God's laws, you can't it does, do that. It does, yeah. Yeah, you can't do that. It won't mitigate God's laws. God's laws are imposed upon you as if you had had the children. Yeah. <laughs> 
because you would have chosen to hold on to the injury if you had these children. Yeah. So my suggestion is, if you know an injury inside of yourself, don't wait to have children or don't put off having children. Deal with the injury. Yeah. <laughs> like, stop trying to make uh, changes. Like, uh, this is what I see most people doing. I see most people going, I know that I have this particular injury, so I'm not going to have a child yet. And I'm going, well, if you know you've got that particular injury, why aren't you dealing with it? <laughs> why aren't yeah. you releasing it? And if you are releasing it, it's not going to affect you having a child. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's not a good excuse to not have a child or a good excuse to have one. Like you're, you're using the not having a child or that particular reasoning to, to explain away a lack of desire for a child, which is driven by some other emotion, yeah. in other words. And my suggestion to people is stop doing all of that. Stop, start being real with yourself. You've got an injury. You know it's there. Deal with it now. The fact that you're willing to put it off, there's an automatic consequence that you're willing to put it off. And one of the consequences is this, if you put it off and you had a child, that child would yeah, now have yeah. the injury. And that consequence is it was already in your soul even though you haven't had the child. Yeah. Right? So, so deal with the issue now. Deal with it now. Don't put it off. Don't wait. Don't say to yourself, oh, I'm not going to have a child till later and, and, and it will be better then. Yep. Deal with every injury you have as you find it. You know, that's the yep. only unhypocritical and sincere thing to do. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't ready for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In a way, it, uh, pe people don't understand how refined God's laws are, right? They don't understand that you can't prevent the soul damage by putting off something. In fact, you create soul damage by putting off something. And you can't prevent soul damage by, by putting off a pregnancy. The soul damage is already in you. Yeah. Like putting it off is not the only way. The only way you can prevent something is by dealing with the soul damage. Now, if you don't have a sincere desire to deal with it right now, then there's a consequence to that. Yeah. Why wouldn't you have a sincere desire to deal with something that's erroneously out of harmony with love right now? Why wouldn't you do that? There's got to mm. be something wrong. Why wouldn't you choose love over? being unloving right now. Yep. There's got to be some kind of rebellion in you that causes that, right? So this is where I feel a lot of people make, make mistakes. As soon as they notice a particular injury inside of themselves, their focus should be to deal with it, to address it, instead of putting it off for any reason. Yep. And don't put off desires in your life, such as the desire to have a child, just because you have an injury. Don't put off the desire. Stop putting off the healing of the, the, the problem, yeah. the, the healing of the injury. Yeah. All right? See, a lot of, I, I don't understand why we constantly reorganise things in our mind right, this way. See, if, if we were truly sincere, we would notice the injury and we'd want to deal with it straight away, if we were truly sincere. And we wouldn't put off having a child as a result we would deal with the injury. Yeah. Yep. We would focus our time and energy on dealing with the injury. Yeah. And this is, I feel, something that a lot of people, when they ask these questions about, oh, should I put off having a child until I've dealt with certain injuries? When they ask me those kind of questions, they're not understanding the penalty is already on their soul as if they'd had a child anyway. So, so why would they put off having the child? If it's a true desire, have the child. The only reason to put off having a child is that it's not a pure desire. And as I said earlier, mm. if you're going to not have a pure desire to have a child, then I, I question sincerely why you would be having sex as well. Yeah. <laughs> because sooner or later you're going to have a child if you, uh, if you have sex. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. Question eight. Pretty, pretty a hard one, that one. I bet there'll be a few people who <laughs> go, what's going on with that one? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. mean to say that even though I don't have a child? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 God's a clever God. Oftentimes we think God's stupid. You know, like, like we, think, we think, yeah, God's pretty stupid, you know. None of the laws will apply to me as long as I put something off. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, no. I've, no, I've thought that. Yeah, most, a lot of people yeah. think that. And it's not the case at all. It's the soul condition inside of the individual that all of God's corrective laws work upon. And that yeah, soul condition would create the error in the, in the child. So 
So, you know, changing an action, such as not having a child, doesn't change your soul condition. Change, yeah. Your soul condition yeah. is going to remain the same until you deal with the error. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's good. Okay, question eight. How important is it for a child to understand the difference about the real parent, God, versus earthly parents? So, and, and following on from that, what effect does it have on the child's soul? Yeah. Um, and what effect does it have on the parent? Okay, well, perhaps if you can remind me the last two questions, yeah. if we follow the first question first, which was um, this, this idea and concept that what effect does it have? Uh, just yeah. if you restate yeah. it for me again. Yeah, so how important is it for the child to understand the difference between God as its parents God's parent. versus its earthly parents? Yeah. Or their parents? It's, all, it's very, very important for a lot of reasons. You see... You see, the child has no concept inside of itself when it's first born or, or just developing intellectually that its parents know, don't know everything, right? The child believes that everything its parents know is everything that there is to know. Now, now if the child now understands and is, is taught by the parent that the parent doesn't know everything, the parents aren't God and the parents aren't their child's, soul's parent. If the, if, the, if the child is taught that the true parent of the child is God and God knows everything, now the, the child has the ability to distinguish some major things. It has the, the ability to see that its parents might do some things in the future that are not right and that are not in harmony with love and that are not truthful and that are not humble, right? And it, the child also has the ability to see that while the parent might do that, God would never do that. So it has the ability to mm. separate inside of its developing psych, psychology. It has the ability to separate God's, potent, God's actions and, and God's nature from its parents' actions and its parents' nature. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, this is a critical part of its development. You see, if it, if it applies its parents' nature upon God, then it's, then it's going to distort its belief systems about God. Yeah. And this is the major cause of all the false re all of religions on the planet, right? Where there's distorted natures about God in, contained in every religion because every one of the people who created these religions came from a parent who had a distorted viewpoint of love. Yeah. Now, if those parents had separated their nature from God's nature by saying, we're not your parent. All we did was create your two bodies and God's your real parent. And God doesn't make mistakes. God designed you perfectly. God designed you a perfect personality for you. God designed all these perfect things about love that you can embrace. God designed you to have a relationship with God. God designed everything independent of us, yep. right? And the parents come to, and the parents teach the child that particular concept. Now the child psychologically can see whenever the parents make choices that the child feels out of harmony, are out of harmony of love, that it doesn't have to accept the parent's choice. Yep. Now this is very powerful for the child because it helps them have the ability to make their own choices independent of the parents, right? In the long run, and more dependent yep. upon God knowing that God's choices are all in harmony with love and the parents might be imperfect and they might make choices out of harmony with love. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it helps psychologically the child to separate God from the parent, from the, uh, their earthly parents, and to in fact start seeing God as their parent and their parents as their brothers and sisters. Right? And this was a great benefit to the child because it then gives it a great benefit of developing a relationship with God independent of its parents and the parents' relationship with God. Yep. Right? Now, if you think about, if, you, if every child had been given that particular gift while they were on earth, right, you can imagine the effect is that the children would have engaged more of their own personality, more of their own nature. They would have done more of the things they willed to do. A lot more of their things might have been done in harmony with love instead of just being in harmony with their parents' idea of love. Yeah. Right? But when the child is not separated, like the psychologically, there's no separation between God and the parents, and that is caused by the parent saying, you're my child, 
I own you, you've got to do what I want, I brought you into the world, and all those other false statements, because all of them are false. Yeah. You know, the parents did nothing of the kind. All they did was have sex. <laughs> they did nothing of the, of the rest of those things that they're saying they did. The soul of the child was brought into the world through a completely different process, right? And, and this is what with parents need to come to terms with. If the child understands the separation of the processes, then the child can go, okay, I've got the freedom to enter a relationship with God and I've got the freedom to continue a relationship with my earthly parents, if we call them that, who are my brothers and sisters. And I also have now the ability psychologically to see that my parents might not always be right. And I get to see that at a very young age, right? Whereas the average person on this planet never gets to see that until the teenage years, generally, right? And even then, they never get to rebel against it without getting punished, yeah. right? But if the child was given this ability, we're very young, like two, three, four, five years of age, while its intellect is developing and while its psychological development is occurring, by the time the child is seven years of age, it now knows that it can enter a relationship with a loving God while at the same time having a relationship with unloving mm. older brothers and sisters who, call, yep. who, brought, who brought their bodies into the world. Right? And it will be able to determine the difference between love and what is loving and unloving. Right? But, if, but, if, but if the parents don't teach the child this particular principle and they teach the child that they are the child's gods, which is really what the parent, yep. most parents <laughs> are teaching their children, then the, parent, the child is going to believe that the parents are always right till they start seeing the parents are not always right. And then there's going to be huge psychological upheavals for the child, a lot of pain and suffering. It's got to go against its parents. The parents will often punish it and sometimes violently punish the child. There'll be lots of pain and suffering as a result of these particular actions because the parents chose to teach something that was out of harmony with the truth. Right. So it is very important for the child in particular, that the parents teach the child that the parents are not their real parents, the child's real parents. The parents are brothers and sisters, older brothers and sisters, who through created their two bodies, the spiritual material body of the child, in order for the child to experience the world, but the real parent of the child is God. God created the child's soul. Now, there are two yeah. other parts of the question, so what were they? <clears throat> um, okay, oh, sorry, one other part. Oh, sorry. So what effect does that have on the child's soul? Yep, so we've discussed the psychological yep. effects on the soul, yep. Um, and what effect does it have on the parent? What effect it has on the parent is interesting, very interesting, because if the parent withholds the truth or does not understand the truth, that the parent is not the parent, but rather the older brother and sister of this child that, they, yep. that they've attracted through the creation of the bodies, then the parent gets to the point where they believe themselves to be the God of the child. Do you understand what I mean by that? They believe that they themselves can dictate mm. to the child how the child should express it and use its free will. Now, this is a very damaging thing that the parent does yeah. to itself because the parent is now believing that they have rulership over the child. They are believing yeah. there is no equality anymore between the child and themselves in, the, in terms of the expression of will. They believe the child should submit their will to the parent. Yep. And these are all very damaging false beliefs that the parents retain. And while the parent retains these damaging false beliefs, they damage their own soul and further damage the souls of their children. And this is why many parents pass into the spirit world in dark condition, not because of anything they did with anybody else around them, but because of what actions they took as a subsequent result of their belief that they are the God of the child yep. or they are the person who can rule over the child. And this causes a lot of soul-based damage to the parent after they've passed, uh, during yeah. the time they live, yeah. but after they pass, they start recognising this damage. Does that make sense? So mm. it's critical for both the child and the parent that the parents come to terms with the fact that they are not the child's creator. They are the creator of the two bodies into which the child was invited. 
right? And the child is God's creation, not their own. And if the parents understand that relationship, they will not believe themselves to be the owner, ruler, God, or parent of the child. Yep. They will not enforce their own belief systems upon the child. They will not control the child's behaviour through a force of their will or through violence because they respect the position in which they are in. As a result, they will not damage their own soul further. So it's a very important principle to get across to parents that they are not the actual parent of the yeah. child. They are just people who created the two bodies into which their younger brother and sister or sister has incarnated. Yep. That's all they are. And as such, if they recognise that role with humility, they will never damage that younger brother and sister through the imposition of, their, of, the, parent, of the parents mm. or the adult's will upon the child. They would rather be very circumspect about the actions they took with the child. And they wouldn't be trying to control the child's will. They wouldn't be trying to damage the child's uh, development in any way. They wouldn't be trying to turn the child into an image of themselves. Yeah. They would be instead be turning the child into an image of the child's true God, true, true parent, yep. which is God. Yep. So, so okay. yep. we all have been created with, uh, as images of God. And unfortunately, the parents go, no, I reject that. And they want the child to become an image of themselves. Now, of course, most children, by the time they're teenagers, rebel against that concept. Understandably so, yep. because they are not an image of the parent. They are an image of their invisible creator, their invisible parent. They're not an image yeah. of their earth-based older brother and sister who created just their yeah. bodies. So you can see that it has a very, this is important because it has a huge psychological effect on the child when it, when it knows who its true parent is. And it has a huge amount of positive influences upon the parent and their choices and decisions while they're parents, yep. if they understand what the truth is. But if they understand it differently, they will impose many, many injuries upon themselves, many injuries upon the child. The child psychologically will not be able to separate God from the parent, and as a result will impose many of the beliefs that they have about their parents onto God, oh God. Yep. and that damages many parts of their future development. So you see it's a yeah. huge issue, this yeah. issue of coming to understand your true role as a so-called parent, as, as a person on earth who has, who has a child drawn through the creation of the bodies for the child to exist in. We, if we understand the truth about it, we, we can do undo a lot of damage that, yeah. that has been done, multi-generational damage that has been done on this planet towards children and subsequent generations. Yeah. Mm. Question nine. Mm -hmm. After God and your soulmate, is family and our children the most important thing? Well, I, see, I would say the most important thing is love, right? And, the, and love of God, love of your soulmate and love of your family are not mutually exclusive. In other words, love of God, love of your soulmate and love of your family are mutually inclusive. So you, you, yep. you wouldn't, when you, it's a lot like you, a lot of people seem to have this concept that um, you have some kind of priority system when you, when you love. You're like, oh, I love God first, love my family next and so forth. Now, while, while we could say that that is true, that the very important, most important thing in our future existence is to develop a love of God, and it is very important that you develop a love of your soulmate in your future existence, those two loves are not mutually exclusive of loving your family. Yep. They are mutually inclusive of loving your family. They, they, are, they are inclusive, not exclusive. Now, I feel that this kind of question tends to indicate a misunderstanding about relationships that people have. They think that because I've said God is the most important relationship you'll ever have, that that means that when you develop a relationship with God, you will love your family less. And it's not true. Mm. You will love your family more because yeah. you have a relationship with your God, not less. All right? And they feel with the, it's the same kind of relationship with your soulmate. Once you meet your soulmate, that you'd have a relationship with your soulmate and that would mean that you'd love your family less. No, 
It means that you love your family more. The more you learn about love in any aspect of your life, the greater your ability to love your family, your children and other people. <laughs> Not mm. less. You don't have less ability, you have more ability to love them. Does that make sense? So I feel that we've got to be careful about this kind of questioning even because a lot of times this kind of questioning goes down the track of leading us to a point where we sort of say to ourselves, well, my child wants something from me, my soulmate wants something from me, so I'm going to give my soulmate the thing first because they're more important to me. And the child's needs might be that it needs some food. And you say, no, no, you're not getting any food today because <laughs> my soulmate wants something. Yep. So that, what's a ludicrous proposition? Right? If we truly love God and we truly had received divine love into our soul, we would automatically love all of them. And we would notice the need of one and we would automatically supply this need without uh, denying the needs of the other. Yep. Yeah, yep. automatically. So question 10 is similar actually. Yes. So would your child come before your relationship with God or Mary? Um, so the example that's in the question is, if your child was hungry or screaming yep. uh, for something, but you were already occupied with doing something with Mary or praying to God, yep. what would you do? Well, I, I, love would dictate what to do, and that would be to instantly drop what's going on and work out why my crowd is crying. And it's probably something that I'm feeling. <laughs> it's probably something to do with something that I'm doing that's out of harmony with love, right? Now, now I would all automatically do that. Now, of course, it depends upon whether the child's crying is sincere or not. Now, if the child was just crying in order to manipulate me, then it would be completely out of harmony to respond to the child yep. under those circumstances. Completely out of harmony with love. So it completely depends upon the circumstances in which the child is crying or the child is being demanding as to how I would respond. If the child already has all of its needs met and also has my love, it's highly likely the child wouldn't be crying at all. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. so it's almost like, again, a... Uh, like a theoretical uh, yeah. uh, question which wouldn't in practice be happening if I was sincere in my own understanding of what it means to be the child's earth-based parent. If, if the child is crying, I know as a parent that there is something wrong emotionally for me here. Because, it, because if, even if the child is crying for food, right, then there is something wrong for me. Because why would I not have enough food to give the child or why would I not have already given the child food? There's got to be something wrong inside of my belief system for that to have been created, right? It might even be just a simple thing of me having a feeling of lack that's created lack for my family that I haven't decided to address. It might be all sorts of issues that come up as a result. So what I would do if I was sincere as a parent is I would look at every time my child is crying and I, I would definitely address the issue. But if my child is just screaming and yelling and having a tantrum because it just didn't get something it wanted, right? now I would never respond to such a child. I'd never respond to my soulmate if she was doing the same thing. Yeah. So, so you see, it would be love that dictates what happens in the situation, not the importance of the relationship. Yeah. Right? And this is where I feel a lot of people are getting... Uh, their wires crossed when it comes to understanding these principles. Because they don't yet have an understanding of the truth in their soul, they believe that love can be mutually exclusive. And it can't be. Mm. Yeah. Right? If the understanding of love was in their soul, they would not even ask such a question because they'd know exactly what the answer yeah. was. The fact that they've asked such a question means that they do not understand love or its nature. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and this is where I feel we need to be really honest with ourselves. If, we're, if we've asked this question of ourselves, then it means that we don't understand love at all yet because love would never allow someone to suffer when it was in our power to repair the suffering. However, love would never respond to a demand yeah. under any circumstances, even if that demand was from the most important person in our life aside from God. Now, God never demands anything. <laughs> yeah. but, but if someone like our partner demanded something from us and it was a demand and it was an expectation on their part, 
it would be unloving to give it. Even if they go into a tantrum and even if they threaten to leave us and even if they tell us that we're being unloving to them. And we would understand that if the understanding principles of love were in our heart. So the fact that we ask the question means that the principles aren't in our heart. And so my yeah, first suggestion yeah. to the person asking such a question would be, you've got a lot of development to make with regard to what you believe love to be. Yeah. Fix what you believe love to be and then you would never answer such a, you'd never ask such a question. Question 11. Mm-hmm. So, could you please contrast society's view on family compared to God's view of the family? Mm. Well, I, I feel a lot of our other questions already have addressed a lot of these issues, but let's sort of put it in some kind of summary. The average family's view of the family is that the parents own the children, that the Children are the parents' responsibility to do with as they wish, as they see fit. That's the average viewpoint of the family on this planet. Most parents believe that the children belong to them. And in fact, we use the terminology. They are my children, my sons, my daughters. They belong to me. Most parents believe on this planet that because their children belong to them and they've brought them into the world, as the saying goes, that they have the right to dictate what the child does. They have the right to violently inflict punishment upon the child if the child does not do what the parent demands. Now, all of these concepts of parenting are completely false from God's perspective. God feels completely the opposite to this. And in fact, if you look at God's own example with how he deals with us, you can see that God is completely opposite to that. God never forces Mm. our will. God never punishes us for not doing what God wants. Never. God still loves us whenever we do whatever we do. God continues to give us love, even if we're totally blocked to receiving it. God wants to give love to us. right? So, so this is completely different than the average parent. The average parent in society withdraws their love whenever the child doesn't do what they want. And in fact, the average parent becomes violent in, in their expressions towards the child, either physically or emotionally, when the child doesn't do what the parent wants. God never does such things. God's a far more loving individual than the most loving parent. And and this is where we need to see the contrast between society's definition of love in the family and God's definition of love in his family. So we're all part of God's family and God's definition of love in God's family is very, very different to society's definition of what love would be in the family. And it's very different in so many areas. You know, if we were going to list every area, we'd probably take days having this conversation because there are so many areas in which God's definition of love is completely different to the family's definition of love. And it's imperative that families on this planet change their definitions of love into God's definition because if they don't, Damage is done to the children of the next generation and the next generation and so forth and nothing will change on the earth while the family continues to retain its current ideas Mm. about love. It is the underlying ideas that the family has about love that are imposed upon society. This whole concept that we are not one family. You are my brother. You and I have the same parent, right? You're my brother We have the same parent, God. That makes us brothers, literally brothers. Our souls are brothers to each other. Mm. If if I then see you as not being a member of my family, I am completely out of harmony with that concept. You are a member of my family. It's just as important for me to treat you well as it is to treat my sons, if I can use that term, well. My sons do not deserve better treatment or worse treatment than you, because you are my brother just as they are my brothers. And it's imperative that we have this viewpoint of the world 
because without it, we have national strife, we have cultural strife, we have tribal strife, we have family feuds, and all of those things are the result mm. of us viewing our family as more important to us than other people. So you are my family. Yeah. Yeah? I am yours. There's no reason why you should treat me any different than you treat your own sons or your own partner with re when it comes yeah. to love, right? When it comes to the expression of consideration and kindness and compassion and other emotions, I should be treated no differently. When it comes to your money, I should be treated no differently. When it comes to, you know, how you treat your life, it should be no different than if I was, and how you treat my life should be no different than if you had your sons in trouble. If I was in trouble, I would respond, you would respond the same way as if your sons were in trouble or yeah. as if your partner was in trouble, if you viewed me as your brother, yeah. right? The reality is on this planet, society does not view other people that are not members of their family as their brothers. And they have a very distorted viewpoint of what the family is. And as a result of these particular things, we have huge amounts of problems on the planet generally. If we change what, how we see the family, if everyone on the planet changed how they saw the family, we would instantly have peace on the, in the entire world. Mm there would be no trouble if everybody on the planet saw each person on the planet as their brother or sister, there would instantly, all, all crime would disappear. Yeah. I truly yeah. felt that connection. Yep. Yeah. Mm. So following on from that, how are these beliefs that we have hindering our relationship with God? Well, obviously, our viewpoint of the family is very, very different to God's viewpoint of the family. Yep. So that being the case, that means that our view of the family is in injury-based. It's error-based. And while we retain it, every time we retain an error, we will choose to act out of harmony with the laws of God, which always will incur pain and suffering as a consequence. Yep. So, so because of this one problem that we refuse to accept God's definition of God's family and instead we impose our own definition of the family, because of this one problem, we are creating huge amounts of problems on this planet. Like problems with war and all this national strife and all those things, violence and all these different things are all caused, if you analyse them back down, to this problem of yeah. our definition of how the, what, the fam, what ma is maintained by a family and what a family should do and what a family should put up with yeah. and how a family should be treated. And if we had God's view on the matter, we would never, ever take the actions that we, we currently take as humanity. Yeah. So it's essential, it's essential that our viewpoint of the family changes. Mm. Yeah. Question 12. <clears throat> So, got a parent who did not teach their children about God in Sunday school yeah. because they felt religion got it wrong. Yep. They now feel terrible as when their children die, they, because the children will now believe as they were taught, yep. um, they're, they're feeling bad about that. Right. So, how can they make amends? <laughs> Well, uh, this is again a question driven by a parent who doesn't want to feel certain emotions. Uh, firstly, they need to feel their emotions of guilt, that they've actually taught their children things that are out of harmony with truth and out of harmony with love. They also need to release them from themselves the reason why they chose to, to teach their children these particular things. And a lot of that has to do with their rage towards religion. Does that make sense? Yep. Like, the, the reason why a lot of people never inculcating... Uh, like, like it's one thing to say, I didn't agree with religion about God. It's quite another thing as a result of that particular thought to not teach the child about God. So what is your concept about God? If you don't have the religious concept about God, what is your concept about God? Now, for a lot of people, they chose to not teach the child anything about God because they personally didn't know anything about God themselves, right? Mm. And they're now trying to get away with the fact that, oh, you know, oh, I need to feel about that. My choice 
to not yeah. teach the child mm. anything yeah. about God. It needs to be felt about. So what I would suggest to such a parent is this. You need to feel everything that you did that damaged your child. There is nothing you can do to avoid such feelings. And in fact, your desire to avoid such feelings is driven by a lack of humility. Because if you were truly humble, you would feel repentant about every single thing that you did mm. that has now injured your child. Now, if a parent fully engages humility and fully engages repentance, they will no longer try to change their child as this parent is trying to do. Yeah. They will change themselves by becoming repentant and receiving more divine love. And through their example, their child will be re-attracted to yeah. God. That's the only way that this will be repaired. What this parent is trying to do is to take different actions without going through the emotions. Now, this mm. is like impossible to achieve anything using, using these techniques. All that will result is your children will become more resentful because now you're trying to influence them in a completely opposite direction as what you influenced yeah. them as a child. Unless you release from yourself the cause as to why you took the actions when your children were children, you will not ever be able to repair the damage of that the, or the outcome of these particular actions. Yeah. This person is attempting to repair the damage of the outcome right, without addressing the cause. Yep. And, if, and as you know from previous discussions you've had or heard about the law of cause and effect, if you tr attempt to do such a thing, no good can ever come about because of it. Yep. So I would suggest to, this, to these parents that they stop trying to change their children now that they've done the damage and fix firstly the reasons why they did the damage inside of themselves. And then, because of their new nature and condition, their children will be attracted to them and ask them questions about God and other, other issues automatically. Yep. If the child is not being attracted to them automatically to ask these particular questions, then it's highly likely that the parent has not addressed the causal emotion. So instead of trying to force the child as an adult, right, the parent needs to stop attempting to force the child to change, even if the child is mm. an adult, and they need to focus on changing themselves first. Yeah. <laughs> they need to get back to that. And my statement is that if the child isn't feeling a, a, some kind of connection with God or a desire to know about God as an adult, right, then the parent themselves has not changed even though they think they have. The parent themselves has yet to be repentant about the real reasons why they took the actions they do, did when the children were children. Yep. Yep. So that's my suggestion to them. Yep. Yep. Question 13 is pretty similar. Similar? Well, let's go for we'll it. Because it. It, it, these kind of questions... Um, help us understand the psyche of many parents and, and yeah. also the false beliefs that many parents yeah. have. Hey? Okay. Mm. okay, so question 13. Many of us who did not teach their children about God in Sunday school because we did not want the fear of God put into our children mm -hmm. feel terrible now as we realise that they may be in a bad soul condition because of this when they pass. Again, how can we make amends? I am now talking to my grandson about God when we see a butterfly, etc. Yep. But for my kids, I think it's too late as they don't believe. Yep. If you don't believe in God but live as a truly good person does, yep. sorry, as a good person, yep. does that make it easier when you pass? Well, there's a lot of things this woman is, is a woman, I, I know, um, that asks this question <laughs> and there's a lot of emotions she is avoiding here in this questioning. So let's, take, let's slice this question up into three parts, shall we? So if you reread just the first part again. Yep. So many of us who did not teach their children about God in Sunday school because yep. we did not want the fear of God put into our children feel terrible now as we realise that they may be in a bad soul condition because of this. All right. Now, first thing we should state, none of your children can be in a bad soul condition or a worse soul condition if you didn't teach them about the fear of God. God is not a being to be feared. 
and it's great that you didn't teach them to fear God. Does that make sense? Yep. And they are never going to be in a worse condition if you, if you taught them to not fear God, right? So, so it's very important to understand that the choice to teach the child that they didn't need to fear God was not a bad choice, right? Yep. The choice to not teach them about God at all was the choice that wasn't good. All right, so we need to we need to properly associate what the choices were, and then look at the underlying emotions. Now, why didn't this woman want to teach the child about God, even though she didn't want to teach the child about a fear of God? Then there has to be mm. other emotions that she is not feeling about that caused her a desire to not teach about God at all. Does that make sense? Yep. Because she still could have chosen to teach about God even though she said, no, go to a Sunday school and I don't want you to learn about a fear inspiring God. Yeah. And it's great that she chose to restrict her child from hearing about a fear God because that God doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. <laughs> so it's not a bad choice. The bad choice was why did she make the decision to not teach the children about a loving God? That's the question she needs to ask herself. Does it make sense? Yep. So let's look at the next part of the question. So... <clears throat> Um, how can we make amends? So she's now talking to her grandson about God when they see a butterfly, etc. Yeah. So she's asking how to make amends, right? So, so, so she's now speaking about her children. The things she's concerned about is that because she chose to not teach her children about a loving God, right? Because of her anger with religion or because of her, her, her disagreement with the concept that God's a fear-based God, which is great, like, or because of her anger with religion, that's not so great. She chose to not teach about God at all. Right? And there might be other reasons why she chose to not teach about God at all. As I said, she needs to look at that. How can she make amends? She can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't... Re- Get rid of an action you've already taken in the past. Yep. It's done. Like you need to now feel about it, that you've done it, that you, that you've done this actual damage, and the damage that she's done to her children in this regard is that her children now are atheists. Basically, they don't believe there is such a thing as God. Right? That's part of the damage that she did. She needs to see it as an action she took and feel about it and repent for it and go through yep. the emotions as to why she chose to take that particular action. Once she does all of that, then her children may choose to find out about God. Does that make sense? They're not going to choose to find out about God while she retains those emotions inside of her soul. So even though her intellectual concept has now changed and she now believes there is a God herself and she now believes intellectually that there is a loving God, there must still be within her emotions that cause her to not feel that. Yep. She must still feel that there isn't a loving God. She must still feel that maybe even God doesn't exist still inside yep. of her soul. Otherwise, her children would be feeling naturally drawn into finding out about the changes that she is making. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, what she's concerned about is making amends. Well, I suggest to her that if she was really concerned about making amends she would actually want to be repentant for her actions and that is going to mean feeling about all the results of her actions. That's what repentance is. And she will need to want to do that if she really wanted to make amends. My feeling is she doesn't want to make that kind of amends. What she wants to do is take some kind of action that will help her avoid the emotions that caused her to make these choices and will help her avoid the emotion of guilt that she has of now seeing that she made the wrong choice. That's the reason why she wants to make amends. And that's not a pure desire to make amends. Mm. That's only a desire to avoid your own pain. And I see many parents doing this, where all they really want to do when they're making amends is they just want to avoid their own pain of the consequences of what they undertook when when their children were little. And, And we can't do that. What's done is done. We now need to, the only way that we can deal with it is to fully feel through the results of the choices we made. It's the only thing we can do. 
Now, the third part of the question revolves around her grandson and the fact she's trying to teach her grandson things about God. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, so she's now talking to her grandson about God yep. when they see a butterfly, etc. Yep. Um, but for my kids, I think it's too late as they don't believe. Firstly, it is never too late for anybody. Um, so we can't say it's ever too late. That, that, and, and in fact, if this woman shifted inside of her soul in her attitudes to God, she would find that her children will naturally feel drawn into shifting in the same way because their injury is not actually their own so much as hers. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. So what she's trying to do is teach her children about God while still retaining the injury that caused her inside of herself not to, to teach the children yeah. about God. Yep. Now that is a, you're going to be it's being an impossible task. The only way you're going to be able to teach your children about God is to first release the injury inside of yourself as to why you did not teach them about God. Yep. And that is going to be an emotional process that you need to go through, not an intellectual process of teaching them something different. Yep. Now, the next question she asks is all about being worried about the full consequences of her choices. <laughs> so let's ask that. Let's see yeah. what she's so asking now. If you don't believe in God but live as a truly good person, does that make it any easier when you pass? Okay, yes, it does make it easier in the past, but the only reason why she wants to know that answer is because she doesn't want to feel that her children will have more pain because of the results of her teachings. Yep. Her children will have more pain because of the results of the teachings, even if they are loving and good people. The pain they're going to receive is not never having a relationship with God if she doesn't work through these particular emotions and if they themselves don't choose to have a relationship with God as a result of her teaching them or, la or lack of teaching of them. Yep. And she's avoiding that pain. She's avoiding the pain of that potential, the fact that the children may forego a relationship with God because of the choices she made. Now, I suggest to her is that if she's fully repentant for that, she will feel all of those pains instead of trying to mitigate them by hoping mm. that something will turn out differently and by trying to change some kind of action inside of herself. Yep. What she would do instead is she would need to go through full repentance of her choices. Once she does that, she will find her children will be drawn to ask about God. But while her emotion is retained within her that caused her to make a choice to not tell the children about God, and that emotion still resides within her even now, while it's there, it prevents them from asking anything about God. Mm. Yep. And it prevents them from believing God because they can feel that inside of her is the same emotion that she had when they were children. If her emotions had changed, her children would feel a difference. And then, of course, feel triggered into asking something about the reason or the cause of the change. Yep. Yep. So there is a lot of emotional avoidance going on here for this particular person with regard to what's going on for her children. She's feeling a lot of guilt, but she's not willing to feel the pain and sufferings of, what, of her own creations. Yep. And that's a lack of repentance as a, as a parent and a lack of humility. So my suggestion to her is be more humble. Be repentant. Feel the co complete results of, you, of the choices you made when these children were children. Feel the results of it. Then you will see a change. You won't have to tell them anything different. Mm, yeah. You will feel a change from them that, because they will feel a change from you. Yeah. Yeah. This is another case of a parent trying to change the ch child before they're willing to change themselves. Yeah. Uh, it's in, doesn't work. It's, it just doesn't work because it's hypocritical. It's a, it's, it, it lacks sincerity and it's certainly not loving. To try and change somebody else that you have forced into being as they are before you change the reasons inside of yourself as to why you forced them to being as they are is a very hypocritical action yeah. and something that I feel while many people engage, many parents engage it, they need to give up this action and be far more humble if they truly want mm. to have a positive effect on their child. Yep. Yep. It's a good, good question. Because okay. as I said, just listing the question like that allows you to 
go through, you know, yeah. all the reasons yeah. and choices that a person is making. Yeah. 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 And a lot of times these questions might seem the same. Yeah. The answers are oh, sometimes. Yeah. I guess different. they seem the same to me <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um did you want to keep going with the Yeah, last let's do three? the last three questions as well. Yep. Yeah, may as well. Okay. So these next few questions relate to parenting and soulmates. Good. So question 14. What will a child born through a pure soulmate relationship look and act like? I have no idea. And, and in fact, nobody has any idea. We can only postulate as to what it might look and act and feel like. Because the reality is there has never been on this planet any single parents in that condition where they're in a soul union condition and at one with God. And as a result of that, there has been never been historically any example here on earth as a child born into that union. Does that make sense? Yep. Now, in the future, there may be a child born into those kind of unions, right? And then you'll see what a child looks like yep. in reality. So in answering this question, all we can do really is postulate, you know, come up with theoretical mm -hmm. answers as to what, what you might expect it to look like. But my suggestion is that uh, usually when you do that, you're usually wrong anyway. <laughs> so, so there's not much point to the whole discussion. Obviously, such parents would be completely free from any emotional injury. Obviously, they would also have imbibed huge amounts of God's truth. They would obviously also be living their entire life in harmony with God's laws. And, and as a result of all of those things, you can see that there would obviously be a huge positive effect on yeah. any child that they brought, that they attracted to themselves, child of God, that they attracted to themselves by creating the spiritual and physical bodies of that child. There would be huge be benefits physically, Emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and from a love perspective on the child. Yeah. But in terms of listing them all, all we'd be doing is theorising yeah. without yeah. demonstrating it in practice. Um, what I would like to do at some point in the future is demonstrate it in practice. So that's, you know, once myself and Mary become at one with God and, and in that union condition, then we might consider having some children um, so that we can also demonstrate what it's like for that child in that condition. That would be something to see. It would be something to see. But every parent has the ability to put, have themselves in that condition yeah. so that they could experience it for themselves too, you know. Yeah. But it would be, imagine, uh, it's almost unimaginable a world where all the parents on the planet were in that condition and then all the children coming into the world. They, they would never know pain. They would never mm. know suffering. They would, they would only know love. They would, they would only feel the joy, the joys of expansion. They would never be punished for their mistakes. They, you know, there, there's so many. You can see there's so, there, yeah. there'd be so many advantages for those children. You can see at a very, very long, young age as they might leave home. Yeah. You know, they might be six or seven years of age and leave home. Yeah, you see them after you. Know, I don't need you guys anymore. You're like, oh, I'm totally self-sufficient here. I'm, I'm at one with God, you know, and I don't know who my soulmate is and... I can create abundance in my life, you know. Who, who, needs, a, who needs a parent <laughs> on earth after that, you know. You, you say, you, you know, you, you, we'll be living in a totally different world under those yeah. circumstances than we're currently yeah. living in. And a parent at one yeah. with God would just go, yep. You go beauty, for go yeah, for it. Yeah, great. yeah. No fear whatsoever about how the child will be harmed because they know the child is under complete, because the child is in harmony with all the laws of God, the child's in complete harmony with everything of its yeah. existence. That, and also, more importantly, those two parents, those parents of the bodies, yeah. I should say, will, will know more than anything else that this is a child of God. And because this child is now at one with God, it doesn't need mm. the people who created their bodies anymore. Mm. It doesn't yeah. need them at all. And you might retain a relationship with them because you love them, but you wouldn't need to have the relationship with them yeah. anymore. And it wouldn't matter what age they were. You'd be happy to see them go on their way and do whatever they wanted to achieve in their life, expressing their personality and nature in the most powerful possible way that they could. You'd only rejoice at such a thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there'd be huge benefits to the parents and the child and, and, and society generally because these children would be completely at one with God by the time their intellect had developed. So imagine that. Seven years of age, you know, or even younger, because we don't know how fast the intellect will develop when a person's yeah. 
when parents are at one with God. So, you know, even that might change. There might only be two of them that have a fully developed intellect. We don't know <laughs> because, it, because it's hard to imagine what kind of emotional damage we're imposing upon our child, children now and what effect it's having on their development and what's, yeah. what effect it's having on their physical, intellectual, emotional and other Im developments that they could make, the sensory developments that they could have. We don't know how rapidly these particular things could develop if everything was in a perfect situation. Yeah. Right? So this is why yeah. I'm saying it's a far bigger question than what most people would imagine if, when they first ask it. Because because just the changing of the soul condition of the parents and the, therefore the changing of the soul condition of the child when it enters the world causes a completely different start to be given to the child yeah. and that we don't know what the effects of that will be because it's never been realised on this planet, never. Even the very first human couple weren't in that condition. So it's never been mm. realised on this planet, that kind of condition. So all we can do is wait until somebody gets into that condition and watch what happens when they have a child and see what it turns out like. <laughs> watch, the, watch this space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Question 15. How much does the parents' relationship with each other and with their soulmates impact upon their children? Oh, it has a huge impact upon their children, of course. You know, it, it, how the parents act in harmony with love is completely going to have a huge effect on how the children act in harmony with love. And not just act, the feelings that the parents have that, that are in harmony or out of harmony with love are going to have a huge impact on the feelings of the child. So let's assume that the parents are soulmates. If the parents never engage a soulmate relationship, in other words, they never fully connect to their own soul and engage a soulmate relationship, that teaches the children that it's impossible to have a soulmate relationship, right? Along with many other things. If the parents don't act in harmony with love towards each other, that teaches the child that when it enters a relationship with a, with a person, you know, in, the, in its future, it will probably act out the same emotional damage that the parents have towards each other, whether they're soulmates or not. Yeah. So let's assume, though, that the parents are different to the parents with their soulmates. In other words, mm -hmm. each parent has a they got married, they had children, and then they realised that they weren't with their soulmate and they decided to separate and go with their soulmate. How that happens will be completely dependent upon love. Now, if they are loving, it will, it will have a beautiful effect on the children. The children will open up to the concept of soulmates, they'll open up to the concept of how important it is. They'll probably open up to their own soulmates at a very young age. They'll never have to go through a relationship that breaks up. Yep. There's all these positive effects that it will have on the child if the parents engage these particular relationships in love. But if they engage the relationships with, with hatred or anger or revenge or any other resentment or any other negative emotions that are out of harmony with love, it's going to have a huge detrimental effect on the child and have a terrible effect on the child's future. So it completely depends upon whether the parents act in harmony with God's definition of love Yep. and in harmony with God's laws as to what the outcome will be. Yep. Yep. Okay, question 16. What difference does it make to a child if the parents are not soulmates, or they are, and if they are not soulmates, then considering the child's happiness, what is the best way to handle the situation? Okay, so, so it's a pretty involved question, this, but let's, let's, uh, let's look at its particular aspects. Let, we're assuming that the parents, the two parents, and remember they're not parents, they're only brothers and sisters of this child, um, the parents that we are calling parents, if we, and we continue to use that terminology so that most people can identify it, created the two bodies of the child. And the child is God's child, for a start. Now, if the parents truly honour that, then now we realise that their parenthood is not really a parenthood of any kind. What it is, is a teaching role. It's a, it's, a, it's a role of helping the child come to understand things about its real parent. Yep. So it understands yep. that these, these two people, this couple, understand that. Now let's say this couple is not a soulmate couple and they realise in their future, after they've had children, that oh, you're, I'm not with my soulmate. Now, if they refuse to engage the soulmate relationship after they have... Uh, you know, become parents on the idea or concept that they'd be harming their children 
if they engage the soulmate relationship, then all that the result will be was the child will feel like it's being sacrificed for, the child will have yeah. control of the relationship with the parents, the parents will finish up resenting the child for their inability to fully express their soul and follow you know, what they now know or feel is their truth about their life and so forth. So it's going to cause huge amounts of damage if the parents act out of harmony with love. If the parents act in harmony with love, all it will do was add to the child's life. The child will now have four teachers instead mm. of two, <laughs> right? And those teachers are more in harmony with God's laws and principles because they're more in harmony with the connection of their own soul. So the child will feel more harmony with its own creator, God, as a result. So there will be no damage whatsoever. In fact, there would only be an enhancement of the child's life and experience through the engagement of the process. Does that make sense? Yep. So again, it depends completely upon whether the parents act in harmony with love or not. Now, if one or more parents act out of harmony with love or the soulmates of those parents act out of harmony with love, of course, the damage will be quite considerable upon the child. It just depends on whether you act in harmony with love or not. If you act in mm -hmm. harmony with love, you will never go wrong. You can never go wrong. Yep. There can never be a damaging outcome if you act in harmony with love. It's impossible for such a thing to occur if you act in harmony with love. And this is where we don't trust love, you see. Yep. And I would suggest that any parents who decide to stay together for the sake of their children are not trusting love. They're not trusting the results of a lack of love and what that will also yep. put onto the child. All right? So obviously if two parents don't, if the parents don't love each other anymore and they're staying together for the sake of the child, then they're teaching the child a lot of things, negative things about love, all right? Mm. Without realising it. The child is going to have a lot of misunderstandings about love when it grows up, all right? Now, if the parents engage love on all occasions, then what can the child learn but what love what does love is, yeah. and the beauty and outcome and happiness that results from what love does? It can't learn anything negative as a result. So any person that says that, you know, learning like it's a nightmare that you learn who your soulmate is when you're married, I can't agree. It's a beautiful thing that you learn who your soulmate is, mm -hmm. even if the person you're married to isn't your soulmate, because you'll be engaging your soul more, you'll be loving yourself more, you'll be loving your other half of your soul more, you'll be demonstrating to any children in the relationship what, what soulmate love is, you prove, you, and you'd still treat your partner the your first partner, who is the mother or father of the child, you, you would still treat them with complete love, not with resentment. You would be honouring them, you would be respecting them, you'd have integrity with them, you wouldn't go off and have a sexual relationship with someone else without first terminating that relationship sexually and going through that process. You would, you would work your way through all of the issues with sincerity and love. Yep. And if you did that, the only result on the child would be positive. But if you don't do that and you choose to make decisions that are out of harmony with love with either the other parent or with your soulmate or with the soulmate of the other parent, now you're teaching your child a heap of things that are out of harmony with love. And of course, that will definitely have a detrimental effect on the child. Yep. And so it really gets down to what our choices are as parents as to whether the detrimental effect will occur with the child. The reality is a child it will not ever be negatively affected by the breakup of a parent of parents if the parents love each other and demonstrate this love for each other still. Right? But if the parents treat each other badly and do not any longer demonstrate love for each other, the child will be very severely negatively affected by any breakup of the family that they had yeah. grown up in. And so it, what we've got to start seeing is that relationships can come and go. And until we have a relationship with our soulmate, we may enter many relationships that will come and go in the course of our life, yep. right? As a result of different emotional injuries that we have and as a result of not opening our soul to our soulmate and so forth. And it's not that that will cause damage to our child. It's being unloving 
that will cause damage to our child. Yeah. Right? Any time we choose to be unloving to any person in any relationship, we are automatically damaging our child through our example. Yeah. And I feel that once we understand that, we will no longer be so concerned about how the child is going to cope we'd be more concerned about demonstrating love in all circumstances and situations, knowing fully that the child will not cope unless we do. The child will not cope with the situation unless we demonstrate love. Yep. The child will have emotional, psychological damage unless we demonstrate love in mm. every single situation. Yep. And that includes in any kind of relationship change. So good question. That was a good question. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of the questions for Series 1 at least, doesn't yes. it? Yep. yep. So um, what we'll do is we'll probably get together another three or four weeks and do a Series 2 and so forth of, the, of other questions. Hopefully for people who are listening, that, that would be beneficial for them with their um, parenting, if we can call it parenting. <laughs> um, because really it's just bringing up a, a, a beautiful gift of a child of God and attracting it into your family and having the benefit of that child in your family to learn a lot of lessons about love. And, uh, and I feel that um, our future discussions, if we constantly refer to that, it will help people with regard to their questions about being parents and children. It will help them greatly in terms of understanding, you know, how to act in in situations. I feel. Yep. Yeah, I'd like to thank so you for your time, mate. No, thank you yeah. so much. It's been, yeah, it's been really good. Yeah. And it's, yeah, the benefits are just. Yeah, you, you're already experiencing some of the benefits, aren't you yeah. yourself? And you've gone through some of these things you've questioned about, so you know that if you bring love to the table. That that the, the there's little or no yeah. damage at all. It's when you're out of harmony with love that's the, when the damage yeah. happens. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like the rest sorts itself out. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And the and in fact, what 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 I find looking at your boys is that they are far more developed now, and far more individuals now, and far more able to determine what their desires and passions are now, than when they were when I first met you and and mm. saw the boys. And, uh, and in fact, when I first met you and saw the boys, the boys were acting out completely all of the emotional addictions that were in your family. And as a result of that, they lacked a lot of even intellectual development and, 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 uh, and language development and all yeah. sorts of development they lacked as a result of acting out these emotional injuries, which now they're not doing. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, as a parent, it's a really nice thing yeah. to see. Yeah, and I look at the development of your boys, of your sons over the time that I've known you, and man, they are totally different to interact with now. You're like, before you couldn't, when I first met you, you couldn't even engage them with a word um, without, their, without them going all shy, and, and, yeah. and, and they had no confidence at all. There was a lot of other emotional issues they faced. And now, like when you, they come up to me after after a <laughs> meeting and yabber yabber away and question about this and question about that, and they're not worried about anything and they're just themselves, and it's just wonderful to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, and yeah, and like the the gift as a parent. Yeah. To see that. Yeah, it's just unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I sort of really, you know, yeah. I'm sort of a bit hot on the parenting stuff. Yeah. At the moment, you, you, you've got a good reason to look at your children with pride, right? Uh, in the sense of seeing that they're just turning out to be beautiful guys, and also good reason to be proud of yourself in a lot of ways. I feel, in terms of applying the principles of divine truth, and seeing the results of it happening in, in the lives of your children. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's good. It's good to chat with you today, Justin, and we'll catch up in about probably a month's time or so. Huh? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for your time too, Lena and Eagle. Thanks, guys. And Lena over there <laughs> behind that camera, and Eagle over that one, uh, for your time recording for us. That's that's fantastic today. Thank you.